Hello, everyone. Welcome to the vidcast. I got special guests today. Uh, we got Billy Miles, promoter, dancer, new father from Kazumba Harmony. Yeah, we have Joseph Cuervo, uh, I Heart Mumbo or I Heart Bachata. Uh, <laughs> yeah, everything else. And he is also a dancer and a dance teacher. And then we got Ines Frankel Vasquez, Vargas, I should say, I'm sorry, <laughs> who is a retired lawyer, although she's still consulting with some other people, and has been in the dance industry for a long time. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So we have three things to talk about today. Uh, sexual harassment, sexual assault. And in that regard, we have three subjects that we can talk about. First, consent. Second, harassment. And then third, assault. And then uh, what action that needs to take place if that ever happens to you or to some other people. What is consent, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, go ahead in any order, whether it's Billy, Joseph, and then Ines later on. What is consent? How do you define that? It's hard to talk about consent in a so let, let, let me give you a scenario here. Okay. okay, I'll be, I'm single. I took someone, a dancer from the, uh, to, the, to my hotel room. We drank, we're making out, uh, we're removing our clothes. And then all of a sudden she said, no, I can't go through this, no. But I still had sex with her and forced her. Would you consider that's both consensual or that was rape? That's clearly not consensual. <laughs> I mean, that example is clearly not consensual. So you're saying that no means no, doesn't matter. That's right. And there's plenty yep. of law to support that. Okay. Given those facts. Right. It gets murkier if somebody goes to somebody's hotel room and has had a lot to drink and passes out at some point, wakes up the next day and doesn't really remember what happened, but feels that she has been violated somehow physically or he, because this is the kind of thing that can affect anyone. That's a little trickier. Um, but the example that you gave is clearly somebody said no, and that's where it should stop. Can that be argued in a court of law as far as you went to his room, you started making out? That was consensual. Yeah, that was consensual. But to the point that where she said no. Right, Joseph? Oh, so that scenario that you just described happens yeah. all the time. Especially and at festivals and congresses, right? All the time. And the problem is that, uh, or one of the problems is that the person who wants to issue the red light, the stoplight, has difficulty. Um, she, she might be interested in going to the room. She might be interested in doing so and so, but then in her mind, suddenly she's not interested in, you know, Y and Z. But for the police, the way they respond to this very, very commonly is they look for this classic forcible rape. And the moment there are these mitigating circumstances where you're acquainted, you are making out, they, they just don't care anymore. Because to them, they can't even prosecute that because it won't be successful. So that's a very bad predicament for the victims. And it's very easy to create a reasonable doubt in that one. 100%, 100%, 100%. it is so easy for a guy, well, uh, first of all, when you were giving your scenario, in my mind, I thought, holy crap, um, because we've already skipped all this about like, if you're a dancer, what are you doing in the guy's room? Like, like because a lot of the, the culture, especially in a festival setting, is very sexed. Right. And I discovered this the hard way, that an invitation for a drink means something else. I did not know that. I, I was very clueless. Um, Sometimes very it means just an invitation for a drink, though. Yeah. Yeah. Happens a lot, huh? Could be. And and a lot of people or a lot of women will defend that. Right. Um, they'll say, Oh, I'm just here to dance. I'm not, you know, I learned to dance to dance. Whereas 
the majority of guys that I've encountered learn to dance for other reasons. And so there is that conflict of intent to begin with. Um, so you're at a festival and then my first question is, well, why are you even going to the room to drink? Why is that even part of it? Why, you know, why is it that some groups in our scene, for example, um, there's a big group of social dancers in our scene and they became pretty infamous for having alcohol. They even had a guy in their group with the name bartender and they like they were then sustaining some allegations of like, oh, why are these people intoxicating us? Why are we having these pre parties, after parties? Why is this even a part of dancing? Why is this, I mean, you go into a ballroom scene, you go to other scenes and that's not a part of it. They drink like, like fruit juice, they, <laughs> like water. Yeah. They don't, this isn't a part of it. So I think a lot of that starts with the people who are organizing, the people who are pushing the after parties, the people at the festivals pushing this, doing a lap dance, like creating this, like setting the stage. Right. You know, setting the table so that these adverse outcomes are more likely to occur. You know, it starts from there. It starts from, from, from you go to an event where there's this, there's a lap dance class, there's this class, there's an after party, there's an after after party. There's like, and, and, and then it sets the stage for these things to happen. Mm. Um, anyway, so, so your scenario would be a difficult one. And it's hard to counsel because it's hard to tell a lady, don't go to her room because now guess what you're doing? You're victim blaming. You know, so it's a really challenging, you know, arena to navigate because it's hard to have the law on your side. Um, you know, it's also, I'm sorry, Joseph. It's also really hard to navigate for promoters and organizers because you're responsible for a piece of what people are there for. Well, they can't, they can't they, be micromanaging every hotel rooms, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so a lot of it is personal choice. There are a lot of single people. There are a lot of, there is even a culture of like festival flings. I, I heard, yeah. yes. but you know, people <laughs> make choices and there, there is a first amendment right to associate with whomever. The circumstances are really important. And I have a few suggestions that we can touch upon later okay. uh, for promoters as to how to maybe also be concerned about personal liability. So, yeah. Billy, when it comes to consent, uh, you're a promoter and you've been around yeah. the Kizomba scene for oh, quite a while and you know a lot of people. What's uh -huh. the, uh, what do you think about this? About consent? Well, yeah, yeah I think uh, as an organizer and someone who's been kind of an advocate on some of these issues and more, uh, truth is, just like with Black Lives Matter, the law has not really been on our side, right? The law right. is not really on the side of oppressed groups. It's very difficult to get justice through that system. So for us, we've taken it upon ourselves in some and some ways to kind of help a little bit. And you know, the the situation you just described where you there was consent and then it was taken away. Correct. While that while that is in fact, you know, as as counselor said, it would be difficult in a courtroom for us. We've taken the stance that any, any victim that comes to us with what we believe to be credible firsthand accounts, we will believe them. So in something like, in something like that situation where uh, consent was given and then taken away, well, then we're gonna, we're gonna side on the side of the, of the victim or survivor and do what we can to try to <clears throat> help them find justice, at least to the extent that there are consequences in our sphere of influence. Because yeah, these these things can be very fluid, and I know there's a lot of legal concerns and things like that. But there's a lot that we can do outside of the courtroom as well to help people. If, the thing if about we're willing the situation to do it. Yeah. is the thing about the situation is, ladies and gents, it's a he said she said situation. That's where the, the the hard part is. Now, how would you determine this? I mean, would you listen to both sides and I, I don't know how to go about it. You know, if it's a he said, she said, there were no witnesses. It's very tricky because you want to be fair to everybody. Right. And we know also that, you know, human nature, sometimes there are, there are, I'm not, again, I'm being a lawyer here, not a yeah. personal law person. Right. There are sometimes misunderstandings and sometimes there are um people get shunned or they get rejected and and i'm you know i'm i'm talking also about the 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 victim as well i mean there are circumstances that 
we don't really understand about the relationship between people. Maybe they know each other for a long time. Maybe they just met. There's all kinds of things like that. And, and to take action on the spot is commendable. And I think the organizers need to do something. But to then act as judge and jury on the spot, while you're also trying to do 50 other things because the festival is still going on or the Congress is still going on, there are a lot of, you know, there's really no hard and fast rule in terms of what to do on the spot, because it also depends on the, on the allegation. It can be really aggravated, you know, or it can be something that is that can be discussed so that there's some clarification. I, I really can't imagine all the universe of situations. Right. Um, but but it, there is a danger of, of uh, jumping the gun, if you will, and having the other person not have an opportunity to, you know, to also be heard. I'm just saying, um, I, I have my personal preferences and I, probably would jump to conclusions. Yeah. But, but in terms of doing something about it, because we can all have opinions, but doing something about it as a promoter, uh, you know, you, you also want to be seen as fair. And that's the thing. Uh, that, that's the thing. It's very hard. And all kinds of things that we don't know about. So It's very hard for a promoter to take sides. I remember 15 years ago, <laughs> Um, it was somewhere in Reno. It was a Congress. I'm not going to mention the event name. I'm not going to mention any names, but it was a totally, it, it was a, a festival where salsa on this side, West Coast swing on this side. Um, salsa stars, West Coast swing stars. Hybrid, some people could dance both. The salsa star opened a, uh, a hotel room where a, mm -hmm. a dancer, teacher, West Coast Swing teacher and a salsa teacher was sleeping. He pulled out his D, put it in her mouth. She was hysterical, she was screaming, and she went to the promoter. The promoter said, I, I can't take sides with this. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, what do you want me to do? Okay. The reason I will never forget that is because it made a bad name for Salseros. And the people that are not into salsa thought that most teachers are like that. Oh, fucking Salseros, quote unquote. That's just one of the situation and really true stories that I can share with you that the victim never got justice. Mm -hmm. I guess we're gonna get to the harassment part now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> because that could, be, that could happen before, during, or after the harassment part. I well, consider harassment when somebody smack your ass without your permission. Well, yeah, and that's all too, honestly. Can I um, just chime in to distinguish something? Yes. There is the common vernacular of harassment, which is what you're describing. You're harassing somebody by doing something that they don't want you to do, okay? or you're treating them a certain way because of, uh, of, of all these protected things like race or gender or whatever. And then there's sexual harassment in the law. Which is? Sexual harassment in the law is something established by federal government and we have a state, uh, state statute as well that makes it actionable for people to sue for damages and get money for situations that constitute harassment due to gender or orientation, um, but it's defined in the workplace. Got it. And that can be done by 
in two ways, in a quid pro quo, which is usually a, someone who has authority or power over the victim, uh, where if you do this, I will give you that. You know, if you do this for me, then I will give you a, a, a work benefit or something like that, favoritism, or I'll keep you, I'll let you keep your job. I won't fire you, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And then there's hostile work environment, which can be done by coworkers and other people in the workplace. Now, so that's the definition, legal, legal definition of sexual harassment. But there is, um, so, so it's workplace situations, but the, Supreme Court has made decisions that hold that sexual harassment is also actionable in certain circumstances, such as te teachers, clergy, doctor patient, a whole lot of other other relationships where there's a power structure. Right. Now we could say, well, there are teachers here, you know. Um, and there are also dancers that can create a hostile work environment for people, or not work environment, but a hostile environment. Whether or not the court would actually entertain a, a lawsuit under that statute for dancers in the dance scene is really undefined because patient, patient, uh, cl uh, doctor, patient, and clergy, and, you know, penitent, whatever, teacher, student, all of those, uh, uh, all of those uh, professions, if you will, are regulated. I so see. there are usually codes of ethics and things like that are established. In the dance scene, anybody that dances is a dancer. Instructors, as you all know, it can be anybody, I, you know, they say, I'm an instructor, I can teach you, come over to my house, I start charging you, and then suddenly you're a dancer. You can actually perform, you don't have to be a, affiliated, you can just establish your own, your own group, your own student, your own team, and become, you know, so there's no regulation. Um, there's internal, you know, we all talk to each other, and the promoters, of course, you all talk to each other. Right. But, but the universe is large and there are really no, nothing set up. But that's the question for the courts. So that's sexual harassment. Talking about harassment behavior that you were talking about, that would come a little closer to the other piece of the law that is that can provide some relief. And that is uh, the, the criminal part of sexual assault. The scenario I just described to you guys is, is in my opinion, both harassment and assault, don't you think? Yeah, but harassment in the common term. Got so it, it would yeah. be absorbed into the sexual assault piece if you want to look at it legally. Right, right, if right. Just describing it, yeah, then definitely that's harassment. And harassment comes in all shapes and sizes and towards all sorts of people, and of course, not just women. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be race, it could be just harassment because whatever you know this is this is such a tough subject guys it's because the distinction it's very hard especially in our dance industry because it's not really a workplace if you think about it it's uh how would you it's a social place mm -hmm. uh, and our our types of dances because you know just Election dances are really tricky because okay you go to a bachata room dark kizomba room dark it is in a sense it's it's an environment that's inviting intimacy it's dancing salsa too. kizomba bachata you know it's int it's intimate Salsa could be very seductive as well. Uh, if you're dancing the old style, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, Billy, do you have any scenarios here? Because I could tell you scenarios in the Kizomba scene, but I'd rather have you say it because you're from the Kizomba world. I'm out of the loop there. Although recently we had that incident. We had mm -hmm. that scandal and it was all over Facebook. Yeah, I'm sure you um, all read it. Did you read it, Ines? There were two of them, I think. Joseph, you read it? Uh -oh. Um, I don't, well, go ahead, uh, Billy. Maybe you could tell without naming names. Uh, yeah, so basically, um, there have been a number of instructors 
who have been named in uh, accusations of rape and sexual assault or some like you know even lesser forms like inappropriate touching you know touching of certain things to other things that shouldn't be touching without consent uh yeah and it's i mean some of these things people have heard for a while and i think it's very important for me to uh hold on let me restart my my video it's yeah you're frozen again. dude <laughs> yeah yeah i gotta Listen, restart I like, this uh, boom. <laughs> yeah. like oh they shut me down they shut me down <laughs> Um, it's important. It's important because a lot of people who are not in Kizomba are saying, "Oh, I knew Kizomba was dirty. Oh, I knew Kizomba." Blah blah blah. Like there are no more predators in Kizomba than there are in any other dance or any other sphere of human endeavor. It's just right. that right now, partly because there are a number of people in the community who've been vocal advocates, empowering people to come forward, and now, for whatever reason, now you have people starting to come forward and actually name names, and so things that weren't as actionable before are now a bit more actionable. So basically right. you just have, you have a couple of instructors who have been uh, named in letters or you know people publishing accounts. And yeah, for one instructor, there's been a lot of them. Uh, for another, and there's been a few. And this instructor is, is big, it's a big name. Mm -hmm. Very, very influential, uh, very popular. And um, I guess, you know, it, it's just, it's interesting to see how these things play out. And, you know, the problem with the whole he said, she said thing is, you know, when you look at stats, and again, I'm not, I, I'm, I used to be a lawyer, now I'm a dance instructor, uh, organizer, or whatnot. So mm -hmm. nothing I say here should be construed as any kind of legal <laughs> advice, okay? There you go. <laughs> but when you look at the stats, and I'm also not a professional advocate, but I work with people like Laura Tibet from Climate and Sexual Abuse. And when you look at the stats, very few accusations of sexual misconduct are actually false. On the other hand, very few people accused of sexual misconduct actually own up to it, right? Mm. So if you have 1% of people accused who admit they did it, and then you have, I don't know, 1% of accusations that are false, it can be very difficult to figure out what's what, right? Now, sometimes if you have like 10 women coming forward saying that you did something, it's easy then, right? right. It's easier. And that's when you'll have everybody saying, oh, da, da, da. but what if it's just one person, right? And then be, you, ha you have the issue of how many, how many accusations are enough for you to believe a victim or a survivor. Right. But yeah, basically we've had a, a number of published reports and something tells me there's going to be more because usually when, when one or two happens, it kind of gets the ball rolling. People start to feel empowered. They start coming forward. And it's, a, it's a, on one hand, a kind of tough time but it's also a great time to be able to do a little bit of in-house cleaning now so that by the time we're all able to come back, hopefully we'll have done some of this cleaning. And I'm hoping that, you know, other dancers will also be doing the same kind of, I call it spring cleaning because yeah. this is the perfect time to do it. Right. It a little is. bit of a silver lining to this right. very difficult time and you know, other aspects, but yeah, people I are mean, being out it right now. If you guys notice, yeah, you're right. Uh, our, our sisters are getting more courageous uh naming names because yes. in the past when we had complaints like this whether i mean they would write an anonymous type of post on social media without naming names they would go under a pseudo name so mm -hmm. that they're not even i mean one particular case of a kizamba teacher that was accused uh, uh probably two three years ago he was not named specifically and this person's a pseudonym who happened to live in the bay area you know and that ne never materialized i think the the fact was she was going to file a police report but i think she backed out so there is that uh, many occasions here in the bay area uh here in the bay area i'm in reno right now but uh when i used to live in the bay area i would get calls i would get email saying well uh do you know this so-and-so teacher? Yes, like I do. It's like, have you heard any complaints about sexual harassment, sexual assault, because we're building a case. So we want several women to come forward. So if you heard of anything or you know anyone, could you please direct us to them? And I would probably about five type of teachers in the Bay Area that is, in fact, you know what? They're going at it right now. And so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that name will be publicized, you know, so. 
Yeah. It's, um, again, with my lawyer hat on. That's why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, e even if there are more, there is more than one person that comes forth with respect to a particular individual. Yeah. We, we need to be very aware of the fact that, um, at least in the courts, let's, you know, and I'm trying to just bring the fairness issue into this, the courts will not actually consider patterns of behavior to convict somebody. And the reason for that is, you know, you, the court has to look at the specifics of a particular circumstance, which is, you know, in front of that, them. Other instances are considered hearsay, or, you know, there's also the possibility that when somebody comes out, based on a number of factors, such as popularity, sure, and polarization, yeah, or people who are just really, you know, really in support of the Me Too movement, for example, sure, sure, um, you know, will will make some judgments for themselves, which is which we are all entitled to, but judgments that will have consequences for the person who's the alleged aggressor, and so. There's, you know, there's an issue of, of how far do we go with just assuming that because one person comes out and other people start coming out, that everything that everybody is saying is true, mm. even if they are all kind of alleging the same kind of thing. Right. Uh, there, there are also factors. Some people have come forth. I know of at least one person came forth and said there was inappropriate touching at this festival. But then, and I got really mad and didn't like it, but then I continued to go out with him. Right. And then we broke up, and then now I'm bringing up that issue of inappropriate touching. So it's a little bit difficult to, you know, and, and other uh, victims may also come up and say, oh, I had inappropriate touching too, but that was so long ago, but I kept my relationship with that person, or I kept seeing him, and I kept you know, um, supporting him. And so there, there are factors for each situation that have to be assessed carefully. Joseph, well, is, this the, is this the reason, uh, Joseph, is this the reason why a lot of our sisters are afraid and doesn't have the courage to come out like this because of what Ines was just saying? I, uh, I think, um, I think a lot of the allegations are not taken seriously, but that's been changing recently. Sure. Uh, there's a lot more of this assertiveness training that's been happening. And like, I guess we're seeing it in different scenes now. And um, I know we're talking a bit about, you know, litigation. We're talking a bit about, you know, what happens in a courtroom after an adverse event. Sure. Um, I'm more a fan, or I guess with my group, um, I did a little bit of research. I looked at a lot of the work of a, a bunch of different pundits, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, social workers, uh, academics, and I started to become more of an advocate of, um, I guess, uh, uh, like self-defense, um, assertiveness training falls under that. Right. Where, you know, it's like, it's like the, FBI said, the FBI says you can avert a burglary by having a dog, by having a light on your porch, um, instead of worrying about catching the guy on a camera um, and then going to court, right? So I kind of like attacking all my problems like that, avoiding the adverse event, if you can, in the first place, um, so, you know, so, so I've taught and I've had workshops right. where we, go through, we're in a circle and we go through, um, actual, um, workshopping of the ladies, um, being touched, um, inappropriately, or we pretend it's like, okay, you were just touched inappropriately. What do you do? And we actually role play it so that when it happens, you, you respond to it immediately and you can put it in check or you can, you can detect that this may happen and you don't dance with that person. Um, and there's a number of things that, that, um, that, you know, dancers complain of. Some dancers don't like being invited repeatedly. Some dancers don't like it when the guy keeps dancing with you after one or two songs. Right. They consider that a form of harassment. And so you have to then decide, how do we solve this problem? Do we wait until something happens and he grabs your ass and then you go to court and you complain? Or do you then say, hey, I'm done, thanks, goodbye. Right. You put your hand up. You say, thanks for the dance. I'm going to move on now. That's assertiveness. That's really helpful. Um, it can really stem a lot of the, um, you know, adverse events that are happening here. So, but yeah, 
you know, a lot of people just are averse to confrontation. That's just people, right? right. That's, not, that's not just women, that's human beings. Yeah. Averse to confrontations, period. They're not ready to, you know, to throw down. You know, most people are not. And so, you know, if you watch prank shows, you know, you can see people getting pranked um, and like they just freeze. So it's like flight or fight or freeze. Right. A lot of people freeze. That's men too. Men will freeze. Right. Um, and so with that in mind, you know, you can then realize that, yeah, you know, you can, you can try to encourage people to do this, do that. But, you know, attacking the problem from the top or the bottom, right? You can attack it from making men better men. That's something that we all should do, right? Sure. Make men better men. We, can, we all have the power to do that. You know, don't sexualize women. Don't say nasty things about them. You know, when you're walking down the hall at a festival, don't say, this girl has blah, blah, blah. Don't do it. Uh, and then training the ladies, who are usually the ones who are attacked, to, be, to do this or that. And then hopefully, you know, because there's pushback on, um, there's some pushback on assertiveness training or on um, self-defense. I call it self-defense. Um, to me, telling a guy, oh, no, thank you. I just danced once. I'm good. That to me is self-defense. Uh, some people attack that as saying it's victim blaming. I don't think it's victim blaming. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, so that's how I've been attacking this problem. Because well, regardless of label, right? Regardless of label, Joseph, I mean, it's, it's basically standing up for ourselves and saying, it's like somebody who goes to the hotel room and says no. You know, it's basically stopping behavior. I, I wouldn't go as far as to say, well, don't put yourself in that situation, but, exactly. but when it happens, it's important to take action or do something about it. Exactly. exactly. So um, I can tell you what the reasoning is. So the people who are against self-defense training, they say, oh, why should we train our ladies to be more assertive? We need to train the men to be better men. By training the ladies, the ones who are not assertive enough, we're then setting the stage to tell them you should have been more assertive. I, you know, ergo victim blaming. That's the logic that the people who don't like self-defense take. I've had really good results. I've had my dancers tell me, hey, this guy started to like grope me and I just walked off. Like I literally trained my dancers to walk off. Don't yeah. just be polite. Don't, you know, ladies more than men are trained to be nice and kind and sweet and like, oh, smile. Forget that. If the guy's acting creepy, his hands drifting, walk off. You know, whatever. It also depends on, on their personality because everyone has a different type of personality. There is, exactly. you know, exactly. And, uh, yeah, exactly. That's why it's like you're stepping out of a comfort zone. It's like you're being an actor or an actress and you're just acting differently. But in this setting, mm -hmm. you know, being a little bit more assertive in this setting can really like, like save you. It can prevent a lot of stuff from happening, you know. So, yeah, it's true. It's um, hard. It, it's it's oh, hard. Yeah. You oh, know, it's yeah, it, it's hard definitely. for victims to. Oh, I know. I, I sympathize. I'm a native New Yorker, and I have no problems being very confrontational at any time. You know, you're, any time. Also, you're also a male. Yeah, yeah, and that's true. Also, one, well, one let me thing. tell you. Let, oh. let me tell you uh, another true story. Uh, this is in the past. Also, I used to have a friend who would smack somebody's ass. Uh, especially women and he has done this for many years because nobody was telling him to say no well it just happens to be that he smacked another friend of mine's eyes and my friend slapped the shit out of him <laughs> ever since then he stopped doing it <laughs> his expression was like he did not expect that well, finally, a woman, a certain woman was finally able to stand up and just tell him. He didn't, he didn't, she didn't have to tell him. Literally smacked him. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, like I... I'm not sure I'd advocate that. As, as <laughs> no, I will not advocate that either, but, but it happened. <laughs> His behavior was a battery and her behavior was a battery back. <laughs> You know, but but anyway, oh, wait, wait. I understand. But also, okay. okay, so just questions because of this lady scandal that we heard in the Kizomba scene and whatnot. Let's flip the the coin here. What are the legal things that the accused can do? 
Well, <laughs> uh, if I may, uh, go ahead, lawyer, I mean, <laughs> counselor. <laughs> there, there, are, there's a growing industry among plaintiffs' attorneys. Whoa, of representing people who have been defamed in uh -oh. social media. Uh oh. Yeah, yeah, and and they're very aggressive about inviting people who have been accused to come, you know, to use their services. Uh, the thing about defamation, you all familiar with defamation yeah, character? Yeah, that's part of the so, subject today, yeah. It, so in writing, it's libel, and verbally talking bad about someone is slander. But there are a few things that are required for defamation to actually be actionable or to have something against someone. Um, it's false and unprivileged statements. They have to be, you know, um, the statement that has been made has to be false or unprivileged, that is harmful to someone's reputation or their well-being or their business, and that is published with the intent of doing harm or being so negligent that they don't care if they're going to do harm. Okay, the the defenses are well. Anyway, within that that constant context. An opinion is not defamation. It's a statement of fact. This right. is what this guy did and this is what this guy is, right? The, the uh, defense is that, that it's not true, which brings us kind of back to he said, she said, because it's going to be hard right. to prove. But defamation is alive and well, and it is available to people who feel like they were... Um, you know, that they're the alleged harassers and have lost business or lost reputation or whatever because someone has uh, specifically named them in social media. So there, those are the possible consequences of a victim coming forth. Um, I'm only saying it because it's out there. Yeah. I'm not saying it to discourage anyone at all. Right. What I, what, what I do have, and I don't know how much time we have or how much you want me to get into this, but- We got, we got, we got a little bit of time. A little time. So for, the, for you guys who are promoters, you know, I have, I have thought about it in terms of some ideas of how to handle this. I'm sure you've thought about them too, because the dance scene is so specific for us. There, you know, I, I find things like salsa, bachata, kizomba, and other Latin dances that sure. involve partnership. People are happy. There's a connection issue, which is also something that brings people together. The dances are very seductive, regardless of closeness. Even salsa, one can like literally fall in lust with someone who's a really great leader, let's put right. it that way, or a great follower. Yeah. Uh, so the endorphins are high, you know, we're full of endorphins. We're like, we have all this energy. A lot of it is very sensual energy, although not sexual. Uh, oftentimes at clubs or festivals or congresses, as you all know, there's a lot of drinking involved. Yes. And people are into drugs as well. So there's that combination of things. And the reality is the dancers, I mean, not everybody has a family to go to and have all these high morals and, you know, things. There are a lot of single people out there. And many of us have personal morals that we live by. But when we're in a club, or we're in a festival, or we're in a Congress, where everybody's spending the night, and we're dancing until six in the morning, and there are after parties, and everybody's in the mood, some of those morals get shifted around, depending right. on the circumstance. So there are a lot of things that come into play. One of the things that I was going to suggest in, 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 term, in terms of promoters, if I may, yeah, yeah. yeah, if you establish clear policies about respect and about sexual assaults, let's say, and all of this genre of behavior, because it's not just women and men, it could be men and men, and it could be a whole lot of other things. Um, so have es established p policies that are published that you can Publish. put up, you put Visible, it up, maybe? Yeah. You, yeah, you put it up up front with the festival information. Got it. 
clear guidelines for instructors and people who are staff, let's say, you know, maybe have them sign an agreement also. You mean disclaimer? No, an agreement that they will behave within the policies. Oh, I got it. Otherwise, they will be not ever asked again. And they, they, you can publish that they have, let's say you can say, I'm going to publish to other promoters that there's been this violation, let's say. Right. It, the other thing you can always do, of course, is to just publicize the festival or event or club as you know, promoting respect for everybody. Um, give notice of consequences to instructors and dancers. Like you're going to be, what did you say? Cancel? Cancel culture. <laughs> Cancel culture. You're going to be, you know, yeah. be outed and you're going to, whatever, whatever yeah. you're going to be, you know, you're not going to be let in again. Right. Um, you encourage Bam. reporting. We encourage yeah. reporting. Empower people like you, Joseph, to stand up for themselves. So you're going to support people who say, I don't want to dance with you. You know, and they can go to an usher or one of your staff members and talk to them. Let's say maybe all they need is just to talk it through to get support. So you train your staff to make sure and support people, not judge, but support, you know. And then when there is reporting, depending on the gravity of the behavior, because it can be like a slap in the butt. It can be too much in, you know, like a little too close where the genitals are touching, or it could be actual rape, you know, to the other extreme encourage reporting that's one thing i was going to mention to you all there's there's uh the really important thing is to report contemporaneously because you can have witnesses you can have you know you, you your credibility is better as a victim uh, uh, ines report to who the promoter well definitely report I, you know depending on what the situation but if it's something really grievous i mean it depends on what the person wants to do but you definitely report to someone and maybe it's the authorities. Maybe you just call the police right away. Right. You know, it, it kind of all depends, but reporting meaning don't hold it back. Right. And don't continue. If you continue the relationship with the person, uh, it, it, it causes some, some, some doubt about where one is really coming from, you know? Um, but again, that doesn't mean that, one doesn't shouldn't continue a, like a student teacher relationship, for example, because just like it happens in the workplace, instructors or some people that we hold in high esteem who are the aggressors have influence over the other people, the, the victim. And the victim doesn't want to look bad among like the school, you know, or the team or whomever, all the other dancers. And so they won't say anything. But it is a, it's something like what Joseph says, but basically, you know, maybe going a little further than saying no more dances with you. If something really egregious happens, report it, report it. Again, something, nothing may happen because it's a he said, she said situation. But if you really experience something, you got to come forth and say something at the time. That's really a uh... crucial thing. Can I interject? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I just want to address some stuff because there's been a lot of good stuff, but I think uh, Inez touched on it a little bit at the end, but I think we're missing something that really should be the focus, especially in the dance community. And what we're talking about, like the, especially the more violent stuff like rape, sexual assault, it's almost always perpetrated by people in significant positions of influence, right? Mm, yeah. So two things. It's not, we're not just talking about inappropriate touching on the dance floor. A lot of the sexual assault has not happened on the dance floor or not even necessarily at a festival, but it's happened True. in the dance community. So right. there are two things. One, let's say, you know, a lot of times, especially when we're talking about rape, you know, the idea that you should be aggressive and fight it off, it, it ignores the point that a lot of times the reason women don't fight, like physically fight, is because they're afraid of getting killed if they struggle. And that's yeah, something that there's a difference between groping on the dance floor and somebody actually trying to penetrate you or have sex with you because, right. and, and this often happens. A lot of the ladies, they freeze up, right? And men too, they freeze up because they're afraid that if they say no, they're going to get worse, right? Serious physical harm outside of the sexual assault. That's something that needs to be taken into consideration. And the second thing is, again, 
And again, I, you know, I was the same way when I first started speaking out four years ago in 2016, trying to encourage everybody to come forward. But a statement like, well, maybe you won't be believed. Like, if you think of this from the, from the point of view of a victim, that's, a, that's, that's worth more than just an offhand statement. The idea that someone, especially someone who, who doesn't want to be a public figure, who's not used to having the sort of attention that someone, say, an organizer, teacher, DJ, or whatever might have, the slut shaming, the victim blaming, and also the fact that most of these sexual assaulters and predators are really talented manipulators and have a crew. And often this crew, these mi oh, yes. minions, and I've dealt with many minions in my time because of our outspoken advocacy on a lot of issues. They tend to do a lot of nasty stuff behind the scene, bullying, threats, intimidation. Yep. And it's not always coming directly from the predators. It's the people doing the dirty work for them. People so you have, them. Right. So you have this culture, rape culture, that one dissuades people from coming forward, but also, you know, it, it's like if, if you don't even think you're going to be believed, even by people in the community, right? And what you said, why did you continue the relationship? Well, you can be raped with somebody and still continue a relationship. In fact, it happens a lot and it happens because of this power dynamic, right? Somebody rapes you, maybe you want to feel like you've taken ownership of it. Maybe you feel like if you say something, you're going to be ostracized from your entire social circle. Maybe it's fear that nobody's going to believe you. You know, Stockholm syndrome, there's a lot of things, but just because someone has had sex with or had a relationship with someone afterwards, that doesn't mean that they weren't raped. I mean, until recently, it was legal to rape your wife, right? So, you know, we have to be careful about that. And I know that in the law currently, that, that is something that's taken into consideration, but that's right. part of the problem. And that's, that's why as organizers, as, as people in the dance community, we should, especially people like who are organizers, we should be very careful not to, uh, not to conflate the things that we can do with the current state of the legal system, which I think most of us can agree has been, has, has missed the mark on a lot of social justice issues. That's all I have to say. Um, yeah, you're right. You know, there's still quite a few women in our industry that are still struggling and having PTSD with this type of situation and they can't reveal or out the person because they're still in fear, psychological fear, because that person has minions to protect. Uh, you're talking about shaming here. That's really one of the factors that our sisters are afraid to come out and name names that's a really hard that's a really hard wall to you know to crack i mean it's just as much as we encourage people that's going to be something that every individual person is going to have to struggle with well you know, let, let's get into the scenario here then uh, yes. the other uh, thing since we're doing this on youtube the one thing i would like to say is yeah you know for victims you're not just speaking out for yourself Another thing that you might be doing is you may not get the justice that you deserve, but you're, you're, you're not only encouraging other victims to speak out, regardless of whether it's the same aggressor or not. And if it is the same aggressor, maybe that person is going to think twice and three times before continuing certain kinds of behaviors. Other women will probably be a little bit more concerned about associating with that person. It's a matter of like really educating everybody. But there's just one last thing that I wanted to say on the legal end. Yeah. If you don't, want, if you're afraid of somebody and you don't want them to come close to you anymore, regard, now I don't know the, the level of aggression, okay? But regardless, if you don't want to have an, an, uh, the person come close to you again, get a temporary restraining order. All you need to do, and of course, that's a he said, she said as well, but at least you can initiate. It's a, an order of protection. It makes the, it gives you the power to not have that person come close to you. And if they do, and they violate that order, then it becomes a criminal matter and you can call the cops on them because you have an order. But a temporary restraining order is a common way of seeking protection from aggressors. I'm just throwing that out as a, right. another possible avenue. Or become a member of certain community uh, that supports uh, such thing where uh, people could sympathize, sympathize and help you out. Uh, for example, uh, Kizomba Harmony has a private group uh, mm -hmm. that advocates this. I mean, can you tell us yes. more about this, Billy? 
Yeah, um, yeah. The, the group is called Kizoma Unity, and we started the group in 2015. It wasn't because of rape culture. It was just we wanted to have a place where we could discuss issues facing our community that wasn't in front of companies, so to speak. So it started with just, you know, we talked about issues, you know, instructors and, and standards and things like that. But then when, when the sexual assault allegations and accusations became public, we used that group. Oh, hold on. I think I, I paused again. Let me restart my video. Um, when, the, uh, when the sexual assault, the letters and things started um, being circulated, we've used a group to help advocate. Because again, it's one thing to say, survivors, you need to come forward. It's right. another to create an environment where they actually feel supported and they're supported support. correct yeah. because i mean because you can't basically ask somebody to put themselves out there and put a, a, a ton of weight on themselves if <clears throat> nobody's going to be there with them right very few people are going to be willing to do that and so you know psychologically i always say if you want somebody to do something you should make it as easy as possible for them to do it right so in the group we uh if there are firsthand accounts we allow people to share their stories in the, in the group. Um, and again, of course, to be fair, you know, we, we don't just post anything in there, you right. know, but it has to be what we believe to be a credible, uh, did I pause again? I don't know, restart. Yeah. <laughs> no, I guess look, as long as we can hear you, it's good. Yeah. It has where to, where know, is this group? Uh, where are you, Billy? Uh, so we're, uh, we're based, we're based in, the group is in Facebook. We live in Houston, but yeah, the group is on Facebook. It's, all, it's called Kizomba Unity. So anybody who, who, uh, agrees with the group rules you're free to come and do it but it's a private group because we talk about things that are meant to be private now of course sometimes people will screenshot things but at the same time at least we have a place where we can talk about it and 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 we've had a lot of great discussions about these issues in the group and a lot of people have been empowered who are now speaking out and who are now becoming leaders in their own right and and speaking on these issues and i it's can by, say that yeah it's by approval only yes yeah yeah, yeah. And if, if there's somebody we think is like sneaky or on the up, not on the up and up, we won't let him in the group. But uh, you know. uh, let me interrupt you there, Billy. Uh, mm -hmm. Ines, he was just mentioning about somebody screening shot. Is there a legal thing that, that they can do when that happens? Uh, depends on what they use it for, I suppose. If it's their own personal use and it's okay because they're a member of that group. But if they're going to then blast it everywhere, I, 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 I don't know. Probably the administrator of the group would just have to... <laughs> pick them out. I, yeah, I don't, I think, hate, I any, hate the new I don't think there's an illegal issue there. But. Go ahead. Go ahead, Billy. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, we use the group in our platform. And again, in the very beginning, when I first started speaking out, I was putting a lot of pressure on the victims to come forward. And I thought I was helping. But what I was doing was just triggering a lot of them. And the reason is because it's not like people who've been harmed don't want to get justice. But again, if you're in an area, especially if the people who have harmed you are really, really powerful, right? Like, think of it. The dance community is not like the real world, right? A lot of these dance instructors are like demigods and kings in some of these, these cliques and groups. So it can feel like you really have no option, right? To come forward, you're completely cut off, ostracized. There's no reason to put yourself through all the drama of that, plus the you know people at the police station saying well why did you continue to sleep with them or why were you in the room or why were you wearing this or why were you this so basically you're, you're being slut shamed harassed and ostracized and humiliated twice over and there's no reason to do that if you don't feel support right. and I, I think now compared to 2016 and part of it is because of me too right the before me too a lot of the stuff was on women how you can protect yourself and save yourself right. instead of on predators to not be predators and the other thing is it's not just teaching people how to be better in the future it's also making sure that there are consequences for people who have already engaged in the bad behavior because that's the only real deterrent that a predator really cares about there has to be consequences. You could say all you want, you could publicize all you want, you could talk all you want, but if people who have harmed people in the past are still operating with impunity, yeah, then you can say whatever. Yeah. yeah, so you could what say kind of whatever. What consequences but, are we talking about? Huh? What kind of consequences are you talking about, Billy? Oh, well, consequences for us, if, uh, if we have credible first-hand accounts of sexual misconduct, we won't hire you and we won't support any events that do. And that, that's where it started. In the beginning, it was rape. 
And now we've kind of, now of course it gets down to a point where there's some gray area, but things like rape, sexual assault, things that take away somebody else's agency. I think we can all agree that whether or not somebody knew what they did was rape or not as a professional in, a, in, a, in an environment that is conducive to this kind of coercion, we have the right as professionals to make choices and choose people who are not going to be liabilities to us or yep. our communities, right? Yep. And so we can do that. And that is a really, really effective deterrent because again, I always say predators and any type of toxic manipulator, they're focused on their money and their influence. And the only thing that they care about is if you hit those. If you can hit their money and influence, they care. And when we started speaking out in 2016, we were very aggressive about it. I when, remember. You know, oh, you remember, right. And I might. You were attacked. <laughs> oh, we're still attacked. You wouldn't. You wouldn't believe, right? Now, again, we knew it going in, and I'm used to being the target of stuff. And we're still around because we have a very strong platform, so we could take it, right? But yeah, we've got blacklisted, spreading lies, a lot of it behind the scenes. So when I talk about what these minions can do, I know what they can do because they've tried to do it to us. Now, it didn't work on us, but we are. First of all, we're a very strong couple, me and my wife. We have a very strong product and a very strong relationship so we can weather the storms. But if you feel alone, that's a whole different thing. And feeling that kind of heat, it, it, it's enough to drive the average person absolutely insane. I, and, think that's, and, and, I think that's part of the reason that our sisters are, are in fear because they feel alone. So I, I think that orga organization or communities such as yours and others may start would probably help our women uh, in, 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 in for support uh, and even courage for that matter. Because right. Joseph, if you remember uh, when you had that situation with your friend, there was not much support there, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty bad. Uh, and he had his minions. He yeah. had his minions, I saw it. Minions. Yeah. He came out swinging, yeah, 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 so. There is, uh, I, I think, I, I, there's an organization in the Bay Area called Keep Bachata Safe and Sexy. I think uh, they need more work, I'm sure. Uh, I, but I think hopefully in, in, in their staff and leadership, they'll get to that direction. Somebody, somebody just need to guide them, but we need more uh, groups like that. Uh, I mean, you guys are familiar with that. I probably, Joseph and Ines. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm still a member of that, but from time to time, I would gaze in their post. It's pretty much the same story where they would share certain yeah, things in yeah, Facebook. Yeah. yeah, but they need some guidance, that I know. Yeah. Um, I, okay. I want to just, just yeah. before we all leave, I want to say there are these stories and then there are these people in power with minions, but real common situations are situations with just dancers. And you know, just Joe blows kind of, and Jane blows whatever. And and we have to, as I think, I want to encourage our our followers, let's say, or our female dancers, to um, to know that no matter who is doing that anything to you that you don't want to be done, that you talk to someone, someone in authority at the particular place. And, and if that if, if that club or that venue doesn't support you, then you know then then go to another level. But 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 go tell someone. Do it contemporaneously and do it. Try to remember as much as you can and you know see if there are any witnesses and just if for no no other reason for for self preservation and to deal with the PTSD that will follow. You, you may not want to go to a restraining order. You may not want to file sexual assault charges. You may not want to become the victim and you know all facebook plastered and, but it, whatever but but just commonplace situations in clubs venues uh festivals and congresses are dancers not just people in power a lot of dancers take advantage you know they they manhandle they and and it, you know people are people want to hook up whatever that's cool but it's got to be with consent just remember that all right so uh, last questions here. If one of our sisters or one of our brothers get into the situation and they become a victim, what's the first step they should do? Depends on what happens where. <laughs> Let's just say festival. Well, if it's in a hotel room, 
and there's a rape. What's the first step that they can do? Well, you can, you can call security in the hotel room, tell the organizers, call the cops, make a report. Is it? And if it's a rape, I'm sorry, there's also, you know, if you, if you go to the cops, they'll, they'll put you through a rape kit and all kinds of things like that. So there, that, that's what would happen in a rape situation. Well, in um, a rape situation, Ines, I'm, I'm kind of confused. Which one is better, go to the hospital or go to the police? No, you go to the police, you, you go to the police right away. I think that would be the most credible thing to do is to do it really contemporaneously. If, if you can, if you feel comfortable enough doing that, because again, many women won't, won't do that right away. And the police will, will, will usually take you or, or make sure that you get to the hospital and that you get a Yeah, rape. because for evidence, right? Right. Just, right. just, just, just evidence, period. You know, it right. still doesn't, doesn't, it's not evidence of consent, but it's evidence that something happened and then you can like, you know, build on that. And if it's, just a, if it's just a sexual harassment, Billy, what do you think uh, your attendees need to do? Yeah, if, it, if, it, if it's at our event, please come talk to me or my wife immediately and we will address it. I mean, nope. it, doesn't, nope. it doesn't happen nope. often, but when it has, we definitely, I mean, depending on what it is, we're very happy to kick people out and make sure they never come back. It doesn't know? matter who they are, even if they're star teachers, right? Yeah, oh yeah, because we, we talk to, uh, did I pop, stop again? Yeah, no. if we, we talk to our artists at our events and because again, we've been so vocal, you know, it's at this point, it's pretty clear. Pretty clear, and, yeah. You know, <laughs> people who are around us tend to be on their best behavior, even if they don't other places. But yeah, we let people know, you know, if, if you do anything that makes people not want to come back, you're not coming back. Right. And if you do anything to, to hurt anyone at an event, you're gone immediately, goodbye. And if and, it's you know, a crime, if it's a crime, you'll probably help call the police, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because also, if it's anything worse, we are you, and so, again, this is public. Anybody out there, if someone victimizes you in our sphere of influence or and we're around, please come to us and we will support you. If you want to go forward, we will stand by you. I'll go with you to the police department if you're comfortable with that. I'm I'm an I'm a I'm an ally, and so is my wife. So yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think, oh, I, I pause again, but yeah, I think anybody who's in a position of influence, especially an organizer, anything happening at your events, you got to take responsibility for, right? We can't control everything that happens, but we can control how we respond to things that do happen. So absolutely. Talk to, if you're at an event, talk to the organizer. If it's something like rape, maybe, it, I mean, call the police first or do whatever, then also talk to the organizer or whatever, talk to organizer or somebody you trust and make sure that, you know, you do what you got to do. Because yeah, too often people remain silent and it, 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 it's not good for anybody. But I say to everybody else, also make sure that while we are out here encouraging victims to speak up, that we are also making sure that we are just as vocal about our support for them, right? They have to know that if they do speak up, we're not gonna dismiss them out of hand. I think that's just as important, but I'm- Joseph? Yeah, I agree, I agree. I've had a couple of uh, instances where the, the victim spoke, you know, she complained. Um, and I agree, depending on the gravity of what happened, that will govern who you're going to complain to. But for example, the example you gave when you started about having your butt grabbed uh, a couple of years ago, one of the girls in my group, she told me, but she told me in passing, it was in passing. And so then I spoke to her about it and I kind of made her realize in a quick conversation that she was violated. She, it, was, it was like this transient, oh, he grabbed my butt. And then she's paused after a conversation and then she realized it. So it wound up with me talking to the guy. Right. I spoke to him. Um, so I called, nothing public. Um, I kind of mediated and I got him on the phone and he apologized. Um, kind of an interesting spin on that story. About a year later, it was discovered that he was actually a convicted rapist in the scene, um, and no one knew. Um, it was really just random. So he was going around grabbing butts and just assaulting, groping, he didn't care. And he has that history. So he got blacklisted by a lot of people. Um, but yeah, I think, I think coming out and some kind of a chain is helpful. That chain of support is very helpful. Yes. So 
who are organizing or running the groups need to be responsive because I've heard of a lot of people, uh, a lot of groups, a lot of, you know, um, event organizers who don't respond. And it's like, you're, it's like they're hitting a wall. It's like, yeah. oh, I complain that this happened and he didn't do anything, you know. So I think definitely that encouragement to, if you're comfortable, you have to start with that. If you're comfortable, you know, complain to someone, say something to someone, and then you have that support to then go and do whatever you feel is appropriate. If, you know, you have to communicate, see what she's comfortable with. You can't go and confront the guy if she doesn't want you to. You can't do that. Um, but it starts, it starts that, that, um, that cascade of events. And that's wanted to throw in a couple things. One is to all the people out there who are watching this or who hear about this broad, this stream, if you know of someone, if you're, if a friend of yours tells you, um, encourage them, you can help too, even if you're not the victim. Encourage them. It probably wouldn't be especially advantageous to go spreading the word around, but encourage the victim to, to speak up, you know, because th there's a whole danger about spreading words around too that can be not very helpful to anybody. The other thing I would say is if any of you promoters, uh, you know, event organizers, whatever, are interested, if you don't already have your policies of respect written, I'm happy to help. That's great. I had this idea, ladies and gents, uh, of, you know, you get vendors at festivals, right? Some people uh, sell shoes, massage, whatever. I was thinking of this idea, a vendor that is an advocate of this subject. So the attendees or what have you knows where to go. Although, uh, 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 I mean, an independent one, although <laughs> I would not doubt Billy doesn't have to do that in his festival because everybody <laughs> knows <laughs> he doesn't play. Uh, but I just, I, I just had that idea, and actually I shared it to keep Bachata safe and sexy, that if they want to have a vendor at any of my festivals, they're welcome to, to, to do so, and that they'll be visible, and MCs will be announcing if ever something happens that they know where to go to as a mediator uh, between the police, between the promoter and whatnot. Um, you know, at least that, that, that goes along with uh, what Ines was suggesting as far as visible uh, policy of respect is concerned. Um, you all know already, this never, never happened to my festivals, although if it happens, I know a lot of women that knows me that I don't play, that so they're probably scared to tell me, I will behave. <laughs> but tell me, and I will support because I usually knock on the door and beat him up. But, <laughs> but I will behave. I'm not going to jump the gun. But I will make sure that you're supported, you're heard. It doesn't matter what the big name is. Uh, we will tackle it, and we will hear you out, and we'll support you. Any last words, ladies and gents, before we go? First of all, I want to thank... A lot of, uh, most of you are busy, <laughs> but I want to thank you for um, coming in here and uh, sharing your wisdom and expertise because lately, as you know, uh, uh, it's been happening. And one of the great thing about it is that, as Billy said, uh, more women are being, are, are really getting courageous. So that's a good thing. See, when, 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 when a woman comes out like that with courage and fearless the other get inspired and it becomes a domino effect as you've seen. Yep. Last words. Thank you for having us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> uh, All right. Be, be safe. <laughs> be safe. I'll bring you guys back on different subjects, but it yeah, was man. an enlightening conversation indeed. Uh, this will be posted right away as a special edition. I was going to post it two weeks from now, but I will post it right away. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe. It's on the right side of the screen. Click subscribe. And if you have any question to me or any of this panel of guests, write in the comment, and I'm sure that they'll be happy to answer you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you all. Peace.